Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending April 15th, 2017. And thank you for the links sent in by Tom H. and Joseph L. And uh, credit and the links will be down in the description below. In fact, links to everything I talk about will be found down in the description below. So, first up from KETV Omaha, another great spot found at Jupiter, cold and high up. It's uh, pretty much a light, an aurora type of light show, just I think it's the similar principle that we have the light shows in the, on Earth. Another great spot has been found at Jupiter, this one cold and high up. Scientists reported Tuesday that the dark expanse is 15,000 miles, 24,000 kilometers across, and 7,500 miles, 12,000 kilometers wide. It's in the upper atmosphere and much cooler than the hot surroundings, thus the name Great Cold Spot. And unlike the giant planet's familiar Great Red Spot, this newly discovered weather system is continually changing in shape and size. It's formed by the energy from Jupiter's polar auroras. A British team used a telescope in Chile to chart the temperatures and density of Jupiter's atmosphere. When the searchers compared the data with thousands of images taken in years past with the telescope in Hawaii, the great cold spot stood out. It could be thousands of years old. And then something that is pretty much similar, dazzling light show spotted on Uranus. This is popular science. And they uh, show two pictures of uh, composites here of uh, from the surface of Uranus, which is Basically, a lot of the times the surface is just solid blue. There's really not a lot to see, but once in a while something does take place. Uh, Uranus may smell like farts according to some recent scientific speculation, but it's still a majestic ice giant, and it's got a lot going on. A new photo taken by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope captures a bit of a light show. Just like Earth, Uranus sometimes boasts auroras similar to northern lights. Auroras occur when charged particles interact with the planet's magnetic field and collide with gas atoms in the upper atmosphere, which give off light. On Earth, this happens with solar winds, plasma full of charged particles from the sun get up in our business. So um, one of the reasons why you'll probably never see any kind of uh, auroras on Mars is it has no magnetic field. It's got some residual magnetism in the rocks left over from some time in the past when it most likely did have a magnetic field surrounding it. But now you'll never actually see something like that unless there's some other effect to cause it. But there's been no evidence of anything like that happening. So. And also after um, this, right next to this uh, popular science article is the YouTube video that um, Joe sent me that's got a lot better pictures and a lot better descriptions. So I would suggest given the choice of the two, the pop sci is worth a short read, but watch the video. It's an under three minute video and it's got some really good pictures um, showing the effects in Uranus. And next up from Fox News Science, big shiny asteroid to, fr to fly safely past Earth on April 19th. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I haven't seen it so far. This is one of the first times I haven't seen uh, uh, one of those clickbait type of things on Facebook where people are saying an uh, asteroid could possibly hit the Earth, and then you read the article and you find out there's no chance it could hit Earth. But anyway, a whopper of an asteroid will make a close ap approach to Earth on April 19th. That's just a few days away. There's no need to panic, though. NASA says it won't collide with our planet, but it will get extremely close for an asteroid of that size. Named 2014 JO25, this giant rock measures approximately 2,000 feet across about the height of the Shanghai Tower, China's tallest building and the second tallest building in the world. It will pass by Earth at a safe distance of 1.1 million miles, five times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So I don't consider that a very close pass. I mean, maybe in the scheme of the entire solar system, but um, as far as endangering us. And it says here, small asteroids pass within this distance of Earth several times each week, and this upcoming close approach is the closest by any known asteroid of this size or larger since asteroid to Tatus, a 3.1 mile asteroid which approached within about four lunar distances on September 2004, NASA officials said in the statement. Yeah, it also leaves me kind of concerned because the budget was cut for doing asteroid studies and uh, I think asteroid deflection is one thing we need to put a little bit more money into myself personally, although I am appreciative that they're going to uh, push forward with the Mars mission, uh, humans to Mars and uh, the other stuff with Enceladus too. And speaking of Enceladus here, Another smoking gun in the search for life in Enceladus Ocean. Today, NASA-funded scientists announced a major new step in search for life on Enceladus, Saturn's sixth largest moon. Thanks to new data collected by NASA ESA Cassini mission, Enceladus has attracted a lot of interest because of an active pole that spews jets of materials into outer space. During its last flyby over the pole, an instrument on board the Cassini spacecraft detected the, president, the presence of a biomarker, molecular hydrogen, that suggests that the ocean we know lies beneath the moon's surface could indeed contain an ecosystem similar to the ones we find in deep sea hydrothermal vents on Earth. Uh, 
Tom actually sent me the link to the NASA live feed from NASA TV. Now, I don't know if you can go to NASA television on YouTube and still find it. It might be worth searching for. You probably could just with a, a simple search find it. Or if I can uh, get it, um, I'll put it on a link just below the link to this article here um, from SETI.org. But it is a step up for NASA. I've, I've always thought that NASA, I, I've appreciated what NASA can do. They're a great organization, but their public relations is horrible. In this case, they actually did a step up. It was kind of cool. They had a a little model of Enceladus that was about maybe the size of a large beach ball and it was spewing out some kind of steam probably they had some kind of you know heated water in it that was and then the guy took a little model with a stick of the probe and went across these little steam vents showing how the he was the guy that actually developed that part of the probe that sensed these uh, chemicals in the, uh, the jets themselves and demonstrated how it flew over and stuff like that I mean <clears throat> still more like uh, middle school science or something like that, but an improvement on what NASA has been doing for public relations compared to what they have done in the past. So, and last up, Japan has plans to drill through the Earth's crust and reach the mantle. Now, um, this is not going to happen anytime soon. It's going to be very expensive, so I'm kind of saying I think it's about a 50-50 chance it's even going to take place because this is going to be scheduled for 2030 and cost about half a billion dollars, but Few things get us more excited than audacious research projects, which also sound like potential blackmail plots from an old James Bond movie. I don't know why he put that opening line in there. That was kind of silly. But fortunately, a new adventure from the scientists at the Japan Agency of Marine Earth Science and Technology, JAMSTEC, hits both checkpoints with flying colors. It is happening to be the first firm in history to successfully drill down into Earth. It is planned to be uh, referring to the molten rock center that lurks beneath the planet's outer crust. Put, to put them in perspective, the mantle makes up about 80% of the Earth's entire mass. Now, they don't say exactly how far, but they, they say the plan is to start drilling about two and a half miles down on the ocean floor and then going another 3.7 miles straight down to reach the mantle. So uh, I don't know if that's enough to really reach it. They've got several sites picked out and everything, but yeah, they're going to actually give it a try now. I don't know compared to the amount of money spent what's going to be learned from it or anything. And like I said, for, for being so far away, I think it's a long shot at this this point, especially depending on how the economy is too. If the economy isn't doing too good, I don't think the Japanese government's going to be really um, keen on spending like, uh, you know, half a billion dollars on the project unless, unless they can get a lot of science out of it or a lot of uh, ideas for other stuff, maybe improvements in drilling technology or something, quite possibly. I mean, if they could get maybe some fi uh, private funding in there, too, from uh, oil drilling companies and stuff like that. But anyway, that's about it for this week. Thank you again, um, Tom and Joe, for uh, sending in those links for the TDD report. And I uh, hope everybody has a happy Easter. I will catch you next week.